Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is uh, Ben Hale. I'm an associate professor in the philosophy department in the environmental studies program. I'm also the acting interim director of the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization. Um, it uh, gives me great pleasure to, uh, to welcome you all here. I want to tell you a little bit about the Benson Center, and then I'm going to hand the mic over to uh, William Allen, who is our visiting fellow, uh, or one of our visiting fellows for the year. Um, he'll do the introduction. But basically, if you're not fam familiar with the Benson Center, um, uh, you may have been familiar with the Center for Western Civilization and Thought. Uh, that was our name last year. Uh, we've just recently rebranded it as the Benson Center for we the Study of Western Civilization. You'll notice a lot of changes on our website, which is located at www.colorado.edu slash center slash Benson, I believe. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, but just Google it and it'll pop up immediately. Uh, there you'll find a bunch of information about what we do, including all the events that we put on. This is actually our fifth talk this semester. Uh, we've been frantically running talks for the past uh, several weeks. We've had uh, uh, several folks out in philosophy and political science and, and, and classics and economics. Um, and uh, we have uh, many exciting uh, talks uh, coming up. Um, earlier this week, we had Ross Dutat from, uh, from the New York Times uh, out here. Uh, next week, we have actually nothing, which is amazing for all of us. Uh, but but <laughs> this is the first empty week. Uh, I think we're all going to take a breather. Uh, following that, that we're going to have uh, uh, histori uh, ec economic historian uh, Robert Mary uh, come out. Uh, shortly after that, oops, this is not. Uh, shortly after that, we're going to have um, uh, uh, Jonathan Haidt, uh, the psychologist, uh, uh, social psychologist Jonathan Haidt. We have several uh, state, Colorado state senators who are partnering with the Center for Science and Technology Policy Research over uh, uh, on main campus here at Ceres, the Cooperative Institute for Research in the Environmental Sciences, to bring in three different uh, state senators um, whose names are not immediately available, available to me, but you can check on our website. Uh, we also are going to bring out philosophers Larry Temkin and Jason Brennan. Uh, and uh, University of Chicago President um, Robert Zimmer, I believe is his name, mm -hmm. uh, among other people, right? And so this is constantly changing. We have actually a lot of activities, not to mention we have a bunch of fellows in town uh, who are with us for the year. Um, we have regular meetings. Um, there's a lot of exciting things happening. I encourage you to go to the website. Um, but because it's all written up online, I don't want to bore you with the details. Uh, you can just read it there. Um, more important is to get on with the show. So I'm going to hand the mic over to, to um, William Allen, and he will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Yep. Good evening, everyone. About to do something I've always wanted to do and have never before had the chance. <laughs> uh, and that is to introduce uh, someone I regard as a dear friend, but more importantly, as a colleague whom I esteem most highly, and that's Diana Shaw. Diana comes to us from Loyola University in Maryland, but I have known her for virtually my entire career. We met early on when we were still probably graduate students at an American Political Science Association meeting. And, and on that occasion, I was utterly taken with her intelligence. I want you to know that over the course of the years I have paid close attention to Diana's work and I've learned a great deal from her. Her important book, Erotic Liberalism, which is a study of Montesquieu, or the subtitle Women and Revolution in Montesquieu's Persian Letters, <coughs> makes a seminal contribution to our understanding of that Enlightenment philosopher in one of the areas of inquiry which is most salient in our own time and allows us to traverse the distance from the 18th century into the 21st century without having to experience the paradoxes and conundrums of wondering where we came from. Uh, I have found over the course of the years that uh, Diana's uh, teaching and writing and her writings include more articles and materials than I can recite for you. She has at least 70 very important articles that she's published and a long history of, of service as well and experience on several campuses, including Princeton University and Harvard as visiting scholar and teacher. But what I want to emphasize most completely is that Diana brings a full command of political philosophy 
to the task that she undertakes in the classroom and in her writing. And does so in a way that makes it accessible to even the ordinary understanding. Uh, as she served on the Bioethics Commission, I believe it's a proper mm -hmm. title, uh, with uh, Leon Cass among others, you could see the flourishing someone who was operating in a field that wouldn't automatically be identified as an area of expertise, but with complete command of the subject matter. And that's the same way in which she approaches the topics of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington. In short, she expands from the ancient world, ancient philosophy, through the Enlightenment, into the experience of American political thought and historical development with a poem, with genuine gracefulness and ease. And it is especially important to me and valuable as I see it, that she's opening the series of nine lectures that we're bringing this year as part of the American National Character Project and placing at the outset the goals of that project in terms that allow us to see it in a manner that is none less than transcendent. Uh, Diana has also uh, written works and published works in the New Atlantis, National Affairs, Claremont Review of Books, the City Journal, the New Criterion, Commentary, uh, and as she would put it, the much missed Weekly Standard. <laughs> now, you, you've seen her, her biography, so I'm not going to read it all to you, but I, I do want you to know that as we welcome her this evening, uh, we're actually welcoming someone who has made a mark within the discipline and beyond, and whose contributions will certainly remain for us to benefit from for a long time to come, and for some of you, I hope, starting right now. <laughs> Well, that is something that I've always wanted to do too, namely be introduced by you. And now that it's happened, <laughs> it is as I expected, much too generous. Uh, uh, no, I don't, but I will speak up now that I'm not being so modest. Uh, <laughs> once I moved to the, to the lecture, that, that, was, uh, that was wonderful and uh, very humbling actually. Um, I'm delighted to be here to deliver the annual Constitution Day lecture. Uh, I want to warn you that I'm going to be giving this word Constitution a rather broad meaning, since I'll be looking at the Constitution of our national character rather than our written Constitution. And more specifically, I'll be speaking about a statesman who worked diligently and deftly to reshape the American character in a way that would foster racial reconciliation, because he believed that civic friendship was a necessary foundation for constitutional liberty. Uh, that statesman was Booker T. Washington. Uh, maybe just a word about his life before we begin in earnest. Uh, Booker T. Washington was born into slavery. Uh, he was freed as a youngster by the Emancipation Proclamation. By dint of extraordinary effort, he managed to acquire an education and then devoted himself to the educational and economic uplift of his people. While only in his 20s, he founded Tuskegee Institute, which he then built into the showplace of black education, uh, black higher education. In 1895, he was invited to give an address at the Atlanta Exposition, one of these big sort of uh, world fairs. Uh, he thereby became the first African American to appear on the same platform with Southern whites. Washington's speech catapulted him to national fame. Uh, Frederick Douglass having died that same year, Washington succeeded Douglass as the nation's best known and most highly regarded black figure, a position that he held for the next 20 years until his death in 1915. Uh, he tells his uh, remarkable life story in his autobiography, Up From Slavery. Uh, I think it's a work that should be on the required reading list of all Americans. Now, the part of Washington's project that I'm going to discuss tonight is how he deployed the memory of Abraham Lincoln to address the terrible racial troubles of his time. Uh, remember, the era in which Washington lived was an era uh, during which segregation was becoming harsher 
and increasingly codified in the law. Uh, despite the existence of the 15th Amendment, the black population by this point had been, all been almost completely disenfranchised. Uh, the Democratic Party, which had not much changed from its slavocratic past, had monopoly control of the entire South. Uh, and what that meant is that white politicians strove to outdo one another in demagogic appeals to racial hostility. Uh, finally, lynchings and other terroristic practices to maintain white supremacy were at their peak. So Booker T. Washington, who was working from within the Deep South, right, Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, he's sort of within the belly of the beast, he had to devise a strategy and a way of speaking that would reach and transform these separate and antagonistic audiences. Uh, the invocation of Lincoln was an essential part of Washington's bridge building rhetoric. Washington's treatments of Lincoln are of two main sorts. First, there are brief references to Lincoln in sort of pedagogical and hortatory speeches delivered to black audiences. Uh, and second, there are a few speeches devoted uh, explicitly and extensively to Lincoln. Uh, those are presented on ceremonial occasions to mainly white audiences. Uh, most typical of the first, the addresses to black audiences, are Washington's Sunday evening talks. Uh, this was a regular forum that Washington held for students of Tuskegee. Uh, they're sort of homilies on character formation. Uh, and Washington would fairly often cite Lincoln, counseling emulation of his virtues, especially honesty and simplicity. So for instance, in a talk entitled Strength in Simplicity, Washington explores various ways in which the self is projected into the world. We utter ourselves or outer ourselves, whether through words or more superficial expressions like modes of address and dress. Washington urges simplicity in all things. One's dress should be neat and modest rather than attention grabbing. One should claim no self-aggrandizing titles, and one should use plain speech. Lincoln is offered as a model of this sort of humble self-presentation. Uh, Washington says, nobody would ever speak of Abraham Lincoln as LLD or anything of that kind. You could not add a single element of strength to his name by giving him all the titles you could conjure. More significantly, Washington, I'm sorry, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address uh, is invoked to demonstrate the great power of the simplest words. Uh, as a young man, while at Hampton Institute, Booker had studied the speeches of Lincoln. And in turn, he recommended such study to his own students at Tuskegee. One lesson he derived from that study is that simple prose is not incompatible with subtle statesmanship. Uh, part of what I'm trying to show is what a subtle statesman uh, Washington is. Uh, within a month of this Sunday evening talk, Washington delivered his most important speech about Lincoln. Uh, it was February 12, 1909. It was the centennial of Lincoln's birth. He delivered that speech before the Republican Club of New York City. This address on Abraham Lincoln, I think, deserves to be ranked with Frederick Douglass's much better known address, uh, the oration in memory of Abraham Lincoln, which Douglass delivered in 1876. Uh, Washington's speech, moreover, serves as a precursor for two important later African-American speeches with connections to Lincoln. Washington's successor at Tuskegee, Robert Moton, delivered the keynote speech at the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial uh, on the National Mall. That took place in 1922. And then Martin Luther King, of course, famously delivers his I Have a Dream speech in front of the Lincoln Memorial in 1860, uh, sorry, 1963 uh, on the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation. So there is a kind of tradition of black leaders reflecting on Lincoln with a backdrop often provided by various Lincoln monuments and memorabilia. Uh, I think this tradition continues. Uh, witness Barack Obama announcing his candidacy from uh, his candidacy for the presidency from Springfield, Illinois, uh, and then taking the oath of office on the Lincoln Bible, right, which is now known as the Lincoln Obama Bible. Uh, because of his longstanding commitment to deliver the New York Address, Washington had to decline an invitation to speak in Springfield itself on Lincoln's birthday. Uh, 
Uh, he wrote a letter to the organizer of the event, and he stated, there is no spot in America where it would have given me greater satisfaction to have spoken my word. And not just because it was the city that he loved and the city where his body rests, but because, Washington says, of recent occurrences in this city. What Washington had in mind were the Springfield race riots of the previous summer. Those events, two days of intense rioting by white mobs, followed by weeks of sporadic attacks, were far from the first instance of anti-black mob action in a northern city, but they did capture the attention of the nation, given both the location uh, and the toll of the violence. Uh, there were two black businessmen lynched, there were four whites dead, more than 40 black homes burned, extensive property damage to black businesses, threats against white establishments that employed or served blacks, and many injured residents. In this letter, Washington suggests that the context for these recent provocations is an increase in racial interaction. Population shifts mean that many white people in the North who are now honoring the memory of Lincoln are coming into contact for the first time with the race that Lincoln freed and behaving in very un-Lincolnian ways. Legend has it, that the first black person to settle in Springfield was a Haitian named William Florville, who set up his barber shop in 1831 with the advice and assistance of the young Abraham Lincoln. By 1908, the black population had increased to about 5% of the city's 50,000 residents. In the rioting, the first person lynched was a black barber while the irony of that malicious act was doubtless not premeditated, the rioters were aware of the larger symbolic significance of their action. As some were heard to shout, Lincoln freed you, now we'll show you where you belong. In the wake of the attacks, Washington advised both groups on how they ought to handle themselves. His message stressed the need for law-abidingness on all sides. Blacks, he says, must remain patient, law-abiding, and self-controlled, as Lincoln was. Whites, meanwhile, must cease to inflict injustice upon the Negro because he is a Negro or because he is weak. Every act of injustice seeks to pull down the great temple of justice and law and order, which Lincoln gave his life to make secure. The letter, which was obviously intended for publication, sort of written as a, as a public letter, uh, it was printed in the Springfield News the day after the Lincoln centenary. Uh, it can be read, I think, as a reworking of the theme of Lincoln's Lyceum Address, which had been delivered in Springfield 75 years earlier. The Lyceum Address of 1838 was Lincoln's first great speech. Uh, it too was composed in response to the threat of mob rule. The rash of vigilante actions at that time included the lynching or murder of gamblers, blacks, and abolitionists. To counter the danger, Lincoln recommended a political religion of obedience to and reverence for the law. The solution may be a simple one, but it was no easier to effect in Washington's day than it had been in Lincoln's. Interestingly, both statesmen summoned the sentiment of gratitude to assist them. Lincoln had called for a national oath, sworn upon the blood of the revolution, to support the Constitution and laws. Lincoln closed the Lyceum Address by reminding his listeners of their debt to our Washington, meaning, of course, George Washington. Booker T. Washington, who, in fact, had taken that illustrious surname for himself, when he first attended school, lacking any knowledge that he had a last name. The teacher asked him for his name, he realized everybody else gave two names, and so he plucked, <laughs> he plucked Washington, uh, named himself Booker T. Washington. Uh, so Booker T. Washington presents his call for law-abidingness as fidelity to the memory of the sainted Lincoln. So these are names to conjure with. Lincoln invokes the name of Washington, and the second Washington invokes the name of Lincoln. Their message of moderation, for it is a, a message of moderation, uh, but messages of moderation are always at risk of seeming tepid or mediocre. 
So this message is ennobled by these great examples, uh, and at the same time given firm roots in the soil of civic piety. For a fuller account of what Washington means by and expects from the invocation and imitation of Lincoln, I'd like to turn now to the New York speech. Uh, we're at something of a disadvantage here because I know that none of you have read this speech. Uh, so I've given you a handout, uh, which has at least an outline of the address. Uh, and I think the outline shows you how carefully constructed the speech is. Uh, it has 27 paragraphs divided into four parts in between the opening and concluding parts, both of which are just two paragraphs in length. There are two substantial parts of roughly equal length. One of those is devoted to Lincoln as president, which really means the legacy of the Emancipation Proclamation. And the other is devoted to Lincoln as a man, Lincoln's virtues. Uh, each of those longer parts is in turn divided into four sections. And the pattern of these two main parts is identical. Each has an introductory paragraph followed by sections addressing first blacks, then whites, and finally expanding the message to the world at large. So I'm just going to sort of proceed in the, in the mode of a commentary uh, taking us through this speech. Uh, Washington's opening is humble. He stresses his slave origins, tells the story of how he first learned of Lincoln, the existence of Lincoln, through his mother's fervent prayers that Lincoln and his armies might be successful. While he credits Lincoln with turning a piece of property into a free American citizen, in a curious way, Lincoln too is humbled, for Lincoln is presented as an instrument used by providence. To the extent that appeals to heaven are efficacious, slaves were not passive, nor were they without knowledge. In Up From Slavery, Washington stresses that slaves, although illiterate, were accurately and completely informed about the great national questions that were agitating the country. Thus, Washington's celebration of Lincoln is situated within the context of a dialogue initiated by freedom-seeking slaves with God. Despite Washington's initial demurral that he is not fitted by ancestry, ancestry or training to be your teacher tonight, by the end of the introduction, he has subtly insinuated a claim to speak based on, quote, knowledge of Abraham Lincoln. The long second part of the address is an explication of a Bible verse as applied to our martyred president. The verse, which is Washington's paraphrase of John 11:25, reads, though a man die, yet shall he live. Washington finds that Lincoln lives lives still through his influence on our complex American civilization. And he describes that complex American civilization as the moving story of men and women of nearly every race and color in their progress from slavery to freedom. In other words, blacks aren't the only ones to make this transition from slavery to freedom. Having begun with a national rather than a narrowly uh, racial focus, Washington is explicit about his intention to confound expectations. He says, perhaps you expect me to confine my words of appreciation to the great boon which through him was conferred upon my race. Then he says, well, it's true, undying gratitude is owed to Lincoln for freeing the slaves, but Washington insists that this is not the only claim that Lincoln has upon our sense of gratitude. So Washington aims to enlarge, or perhaps to deepen, the ground for both black gratitude and the nation's gratitude. After that introduction, Washington begins with his own race. Uh, and he asserts that Lincoln lives today in the visible educational and economic advancement of blacks. What he highlights is not the mere fact of freedom, but rather the successful employment of freedom. He gives a quick survey of the records so far, citing data on such things as black property holdings, black schools, staffed by black teachers. Five years earlier, uh, again on a Lincoln birthday celebration, Washington had delivered a speech in Madison Square Garden. Uh, that speech was entirely devoted to setting forth the evidence of an improving black condition. It was filled with statistics, 
Uh, Lincoln is, in fact, mentioned only once in that speech, in the opening sentence. But now, in this speech on the centenary, Lincoln is in every paragraph, in some paragraphs, every sentence. The name Lincoln appears 33 times, the pronoun he appears 25 times, other references like our martyred president, our emancipator, the great emancipator. What Washington is intent on tracking in this speech is not what is seen, he says, but what is unseen. Thus, after only a paragraph on the tangible evidence of black accomplishment, Washington moves to the inward cause of that advancement. And he, he says that inward cause is the steady and unalterable determination of 10 millions of black citizens. It is through this moral aspiration towards self-betterment that Lincoln lives. Washington's analysis, this is true very often in his thought, his analysis hinges upon the distinction between inner and outer freedom. We learn, moreover, that this distinction between inner freedom and outer freedom applies in every corner of the republic. With this phrase, Washington delicately begins to bring his message to bear on whites as well as blacks. Here, he has to tread carefully. Remember, this is a time when blacks who were perceived as uppity were risking their very lives. And he's going to be giving <laughs> advice and direction to whites. He speaks in the first person again, expressing gratitude to Lincoln for freedom of soul. The man whose soul is free is defined as someone who refuses to permit sectional or racial hatred to drag down, to warp, and narrow his soul. Spiritual freedom is ever vigilant, denying malice any entrance. Having broached the theme of spiritual freedom, Washington now reveals its application to whites. We who celebrate this anniversary should not forget that the same pen that gave freedom to four millions of African slaves at the same time struck the shackles from the souls of 27 millions of Americans of another color. <laughs> Which is to say, the end of slavery didn't just free blacks, it freed whites too. It freed them from participation and complicity in slavery. It might just be worth saying something about this interesting locution that Washington coins for whites. Americans of another color. Perhaps today's cutting edge critical race theorists uh, owe a debt to Booker T for decentering whiteness. Uh, Washington suggests that all Americans are colored. Whites are simply Americans of another color. After this assertion of equal and multiracial Americanness, Washington avoids racial modifiers altogether. Nonetheless, the implication of this section is clear enough. By enslaving blacks, whites enslaved themselves. And by continuing to discriminate against blacks, whites prolong the self-inflicted harm to their own souls. In antebellum America, blacks were physically enslaved, but Washington implies that it was whites who were spiritually enslaved. Washington, I think, agrees with St. Augustine, uh, who said that it was better far to be the slave of a man than the slave of lust, especially the lust for dominion. Uh, ever since W.E.B. Du Bois, um, another uh, important black thinker from around the same time, he's a little bit younger than Washington, but they, they overlap, um, and Du Bois labeled Washington an accommodationist. And ever since then, I think there's been an unfortunate misimpression about Washington uh, that label accommodationist uh, and worse ones like Uncle Tom have obscured the fact that, that Washington was a statesman of considerable moral audacity. He extends sympathy to whites and he does so from a position of moral superiority over them. Uh, you can see this stance in the remarkable conclusion of his 1896 speech entitled Democracy and Education. Uh, let me just read this uh, short paragraph. He says, the Negro can afford to be wronged. 
the white man cannot afford to wrong him. Unjust laws or customs that exist in many places regarding the races injure the white man and inconvenience the Negro. Injure the white man and inconvenience the Negro. No race can wrong another race simply because it has the power to do so without being permanently injured in morals. The Negro can endure the temporary inconvenience. But the injury to the white man is permanent. It is for the white man to save himself from his degradation that I plead. According to Washington, by abolishing slavery, Lincoln took the first step to release both races from their respective burdens. He freed men's souls from spiritual bondage. He freed them to mutual helpfulness. Henceforth, no man of any race, either in the North or in the South, need feel constrained to fear or hate his brother. With the shackles struck off, it remains up to them to exercise their spiritual freedom. Given the events of the early 20th century, not only out the outbreaks of mob violence, but the ramping up of disfranchisement, segregation, and discrimination, it's obvious enough that some of those brothers of another color persisted in their malice. Washington's analysis has made plain that they do so needlessly, which is to say, willfully. Washington is very precise in specifying what the Emancipation Proclamation achieved. Lincoln proclaimed the principle that the welfare of each is the good of all, but the realization of the principle will depend on how blacks and whites behave. Do they move in the direction to which the new birth of freedom points them, toward mutual helpfulness? The scope of the speech now expands to encompass the whole world, uh, as Washington considers the global reach of the Lincoln spirit of freedom and fair play. Lincoln himself, uh, of course, had asserted that this transnational power belonged to the Declaration of Independence. Although Washington does not mention the Declaration in his speech, what he does say, namely that Lincoln reestablished the dignity of man as man, is compatible with Lincoln's view that the aim of his statesmanship was to return Americans to their ancient faith in the equality of all men. While Lincoln did not shy from the word equality. Interestingly, Washington never uses it in this speech. And in fact, he rarely refers to equality. I suspect that post-slavery, the term equality became even more contentious, uh, particularly in the mouth of a black spokesman, uh, inasmuch as calls for equality at that point could only mean civic equality. In other words, not just equality with respect to natural rights. Lincoln's and Washington's respective strategies uh, might be understood as an instance of rhetorical chiasmus. Uh, the white statesman appealed to natural equality in order to further the ultimate aim of physical liberty for the slaves, whereas the black statesman appealed to spiritual liberty in order to further the ultimate and unstated aim of civic equality. In this section, uh, Washington adds the crucial ingredient of enlightenment to liberty. Because real freedom belongs to the soul, not the body, enlightenment is essential. The worst form of ignorance is a blinding race consciousness. Washington says, one who goes through life with his eyes closed against all that is good in another race is weakened and circumscribed. There is, I think, a tacit acknowledgement in this sentence that the Springfield riots had indeed manifested white hostility towards the best elements in the black population. Although the white rioters rampaged first in two impoverished downtown black neighborhoods, very quickly they shifted to targeting, quite deliberately, well-to-do blacks who owned homes and shops. If whites were intent on sabotaging black economic advancement 
Washington's well-developed strategy of putting economics before politics, or another way of saying it, putting class before race. Right? You solve the class problem first, and then the race problem will be easier to address. Uh, that strategy of Washington's might be derailed. Uh, and indeed, the Springfield riots uh, had the effect of galvanizing a more concerted black effort to demand political rights. Uh, later that same year, a conference uh, called the Lincoln Conference on the Negro Question was held. It led to the founding of the NAACP. Uh, Washington was invited to attend that meeting. He declined. Uh, preferring to redouble his efforts to enlighten these white delinquents rather than turn to the politics of racial protest. In this global section of the speech, Washington presents the lesson, um, this lesson from Lincoln, uh, in a generalized and thereby more oblique form. He deliberately, I think, avoids race-specific language. So, for instance, he says, the world is fast learning, that one man cannot hold another man down in the ditch without remaining down in the ditch with him. Again, this shows, you know, Washington, he's just these sort of homely examples, right? Everybody could, you can just, you can just picture that, right? You completely understand what he's saying. Uh, the world is fast learning. One man cannot hold another man down in the ditch without remaining down in the ditch with him. Uh, Washington couches his argument in terms of an elevated self-interest. Surely whites in the United States won't want to sentence themselves to such backwardness. Part two of the speech um, concludes with the celebration of Lincoln as a model of spiritual self-emancipation. The great emancipator was first a self-emancipator. Washington says Lincoln was in the truest sense great because he unfettered himself. In breaking the enchainment of race hatred, he climbed up out of the valley onto the mountaintop, which enabled him to rate all men at their true worth. Thus, spiritual freedom conduces to equality in the sense that each individual is treated as an individual. It is on such a mountain that the American people, Washington says, should strive to live. Half a century later, of course, this mountaintop imagery was brilliantly elaborated by King uh, in the Let Freedom Ring peroration of his I Have a Dream speech. Now, Washington emphasizes uh, that freedom abolishes slavery but not service. Service is an extremely important word in Washington's political thought. Uh, we've seen that part two of the speech presents Washington's assessment of the service that Lincoln performed in signing the Emancipation Proclamation, how it benefited both blacks and whites, how it benefited both our nation and the world. Part three of the speech delineates a yet higher form of service rendered by Lincoln. It moves, we might say, from Lincoln's statesmanship uh, to his saintliness, or to put this in more Aristotelian terms, it moves from Lincoln as a good citizen to Lincoln as a good man. In keeping with his conviction that the personal is infinitely more important than the political, Washington in part three examines not Lincoln's actions as president, but his rise to the presidency. Uh, and he says, in fighting his own battle up from obscurity and squalor, he fought the battle of every other individual and race that is down, and so helped to pull up every other human who was down. So in lifting oneself, one lifts others. Service to others isn't necessarily a matter of giving back or reaching out with a helping hand, as we tend to think today. Uh, Washington here is arguing that individual example is itself uplifting. Lincoln's struggle, his ambition to do something and be something, speaks to each of us as individuals, no matter of what race or nation. Although Lincoln is presented as a universal role model, Washington once again draws out specific messages for specific audiences. He begins, as he did in the second part, with his own race. 
The debt of gratitude toward Lincoln is paid by imitating him. According to Washington, the virtues that characterized Lincoln, or at least the subset of Lincoln's virtues that are most important for blacks, are patience, long-suffering, sincerity, naturalness, dogged determination, and courage. And it's the first and last of these, patience and courage, that Lincoln is said to have possessed in the highest degree. Without retracting his earlier statement that the proclamation gave freedom to four million of African slaves, Washington now asserts that freedom in the broadest and highest sense has never been a bequest. It has been a conquest. The struggle being first internal and second interpersonal does not require militancy but instead requires the virtues of Lincoln, patience and courage. Washington says there are new possibilities furnished by Lincoln's proclamation, but only those individuals will succeed who meet the internal demands of freedom. Washington recaps here some of what he said in that Sunday evening talk at Tuskegee just the month before about the value of simplicity. Uh, he also expands a bit upon his conception of service, uh, linking it to courage and the ability to subordinate the self to the needs of others. Fittingly, this section culminates in Washington's praise of black teachers. Uh, he calls them those brave young souls who practice courage of the Lincoln kind. Uh, it might be worth remembering that Booker T. Washington, in conjunction with the Chicago philanthropist Julius Rosenwald, was responsible for the construction of 5,000 mostly one-room black schoolhouses throughout the rural South. Uh, and those schools were largely staffed by Tuskegee-trained teachers. And Washington is right that it took courage to staff those schools. They were in very isolated rural districts where there was sometimes great hostility to black education. Uh, so that, uh, the praise of the, uh, of the black teachers concludes that, uh, that first section. Then he shifts again to whites. Whites too, even southern whites, can be Lincolnian. The next section praises the moral courage displayed by brave and true white men of the South. Washington speaks of those who have loyally accepted the results of the Civil War, whatever their previous stance, and who are now working to complete the emancipation that Lincoln began. He instances two former Confederate commanders, Robert E. Lee and John B. Gordon, as examples of brave and true white men of the South. Washington's discriminating judgment here I think could maybe help us as we navigate our contemporary dilemmas over Confederate memorials. There are significant differences between the post-war behavior of Robert E. Lee, say, and someone like Nathan Bedford Forrest, the Confederate general who became the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. In part two, if you remember, Washington had appealed to white self-interest. Right, where he made the argument that the oppressors damage themselves by their oppression. So in your own self-interest, you ought to stop oppressing. Now, he appeals to what might be called white pride. The noblest Southern whites are magnanimous. Washington points out Lincoln himself was a Southern man by birth. In the early 20th century, white supremacists like Thomas Dixon uh, Dixon was the author of a book called The Klansman, uh, published in 1905. Uh, these uh, white supremacists at the turn of the century tried to lay claim to Lincoln as one of their own. Uh, Dixon's novel became the inspiration for D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation. Uh, that movie then led to the second founding or the refounding of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, Dixon uh, and others uh, cited Lincoln's support for black colonization, and they sought to make Lincoln the true prophet of white supremacy. Washington avoids any direct reference to the Jim Crow appropriation of Lincoln. He's aware of it. He's very aware of it. 
uh, but he makes no mention of it. Instead, what he does is counter with a different conception of Anglo-Saxon pride, a conception of Anglo-Saxon pride that does not rest on race hatred. Thus, he says Lincoln, quote, was one of those white men of whom there is a large and growing class who resented the idea that in order to assert and maintain the superiority of the Anglo-Saxon race, it was necessary that another group of humanity should be kept in ignorance. I think this is an extraordinarily deft rhetorical maneuver. Washington does not want any element of white opinion to feel alienated from Lincoln. If segregationists want to embrace Lincoln, so be it. Since that embrace allows Washington to show that white dominance is not incompatible with treating others decently. Lincoln is presented as someone confident enough in his own strength to be just and kind. Washington is sort of throwing down the gauntlet. He's challenging the proponents of white pride to be chivalrous and to disdain fear. In essence, he accuses the vicious breed of white supremacists of cowardice. He says, it requires no courage for a strong man to kick a weak one down. Like a jujitsu master, Washington tells whites, if you really had pride, you wouldn't be without pity. Moreover, the pitiless are themselves truly pitiful. Thus I, Booker T. Washington, pity you. You see? <laughs> Recognizing that race pride is not so easily dismantled, Washington appeals to race pride of a better sort to vanquish the nastier versions of race pride and perhaps to lay the groundwork for the eventual disappearance of race pride. Washington does what he can to convince white Americans that their proper pride lies in dedication to the Lincoln spirit of freedom and fair play. The final section of part three summarizes Washington's thisworldly answer to the biblically inspired question with which he began, if a man die, shall he live? According to Washington, Lincoln lives today because he attained the peak of virtue, the amalgam of moral courage and patience to which Washington now adds foresight. Enabled Lincoln, quote, to suffer in silence, to be misunderstood, to be abused, to refuse to revile when reviled. Washington here accounts for Lincoln's persistence in the face of a very large measure of public incomprehension and ingratitude. Once again, there's a startling element of moral reproof in what Washington is willing to say to white Americans. Citizens are inclined to believe that the outpourings of gratitude occasioned by the centennial of Lincoln's birth honor not only Lincoln, but themselves in a certain sense. There's an element of self-satisfaction in linking oneself and one's nation to past greatness. Washington works against this national complacency. He reminds the celebrants that they can receive credit only for hindsight and not as with Lincoln, for foresight. Here's how Washington drops his hint that a dose of democratic contrition should figure in our remembrance of Lincoln. He, Lincoln, he knew too that at some time in the distant future, our nation would repent of the folly of cursing our public servants while they live and blessing them only when they die. In this connection, I cannot refrain refrain from suggesting the question to the millions of voices raised today in his praise. Why did you not say it yesterday? Yesterday, when one word of approval and gratitude would have meant so much to him in strengthening his hand and heart. 
Lincoln, as statesman, acted for the good of all, North and South, black and white. But he had to proceed without gratitude. One can't help but hear Washington's own lament. He too was a public servant who was much abused and whose aims and policies were misrepresented. While Washington believed that the virtues of patience and courage may be found even in ordinary men, foresight is rare and those blessed with it need perhaps a double share of patience and courage for they will have to press forward alone. Washington points to the role that public support could play in strengthening a democratic statesman's ha hand and heart. Note that he exempts the head from this. And that's a significant omission given that Washington was very well known for his definition of education as involving the head, hand, and heart. The statesman's head, his knowledge of right, his foresight, is an independent capacity. The attitude of the public may well affect his efficacy, restricting what his hands can achieve, but it will not alter his principles. The final paragraph of part three looks ahead. Because of Lincoln's example, faith in the future is strengthened. The recollection of Lincoln sustains the faith in moral progress. Despite the backsliding that appears, Washington says, for a little season, Washington believes that righteousness will prevail, not only among us, but throughout the world. The conclusion of the speech, very last two paragraphs, proposes a dramatic act in the present moment, a mutual oath-taking by whites and blacks that will bridge past and future. Declaring whites and blacks brothers all, Washington asks his audience, that group gathered there at the, at the Republican Club. He asks his audience, whom he calls the worthy representatives of 70 millions of white Americans, he asks them to join with black Americans, all 10 millions, and swear eternal fealty to the memory and traditions of the sainted Lincoln. Washington's formulation of the oath indicates, I think, a key difference between blacks and whites. His invitation highlights the distance between these worthy representatives of white America, those willing to attend the speech, and the unwor unworthy sort. Blacks are on the whole, frankly, better, for they, according to Washington, have never lifted their voices or hands except in defense of their country's honor and their country's flag. The same cannot be said of whites. Perhaps that is why Washington repeats the invitation, but with a telling modification. He says, I repeat, may we not join with your race. Although both versions of the oath are formulated with a deferential negative, may I not ask that you join, and then may we not join, they're not precisely identical. In the first formulation, he asked worthy whites to join with all blacks. In the second formulation, the initiative shifts to blacks. After all, the condescension, if there is any among brothers, would be on the black side. They, in their loyalty, are willing to reach out to the whole white world, even though so many white Americans have so often betrayed the nation's founding principles. If kept, this oath of brotherhood, sworn upon the blood of Lincoln, could heal both the sectional and racial divides, thereby ensuring that Lincoln should not, have died, should not have lived and died in vain. This is what we must here highly resolve. Washington's language deliberately echoes the Gettysburg Address, although the idea of a sacred oath as a political instrument for securing our national freedom is more reminiscent, I think, of the Lyceum Address. Despite these resonances and parallels, Washington's address has a different overall arc than either the Lyceum or Gettysburg Addresses, both of which, both the Lyceum and the Gettysburg, Lincoln speeches, begin with praise of the founding fathers. Right? Our fa the fathers bequeathed us a political edifice of liberty, as the Lyceum Address puts it, or brought forth a new nation conceived in liberty, as the Gettysburg Address has it. Washington, however, does not begin either his speech or his life in that way. He takes his initial conception from slavery. I was born a slave, he says. 
He moves from the prayers of a slave to the promises of a free man. As the title of his autobiography, Up From Slavery, indicates, Washington believed that slavery served as a school of freedom, teaching those who had been through that crucible the deepest meaning of freedom. In the final paragraph, Washington offers his own pledge, and I believe he intends this personal pledge to be kept regardless of the set success or failure of the mutual black-white justice oath. This pledge transcends politics. The power to manifest the highest possibilities of citizenship and humanity is a spiritual power, and as such does not depend on whites making good on their oath to justice, goodwill, and peace. Even if either whites or blacks collectively fail in their respective pledges, the individual possibility of abiding with Lincoln would remain. Booker T. Washington, through times of terrible trouble in American race relations, did remain true to Lincoln, acting with malice toward none, with charity for all. I hope the time will come when he will be generally acknowledged as among the greatest of American statesmen, with much to teach us today about the path to racial concord. Thanks. Happy to take some questions. Yes. Yes, uh, that sounds good. I went to the University of Chicago, and that was our protocol too. So, <laughs> students, yes. You're leaving. You don't have a question. No, I actually. Did you mention that before you spoke? Okay. <coughs> Was that our only student? <laughs> they might. I believe in just waiting people out. <laughs> no? All right. Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I have to acknowledge the first time I've ever heard a presentation of Booker T. Washington, where the name W. E. B. Du Bois was only mentioned once, <laughs> <laughs> and in and in disagreement with yeah. Du Bois, yes. Well, well, of course. Yeah. But I, I wonder. Um, you mentioned that with his speech at the Atlantic Exposition, you placed Douglas as sort of a leading yeah. black spokesperson. Um, but is it? Would you agree that that was a very temporary? position from the public's perspective. I mean, the irony, 1909, the NAACP was formed, and the boys, and yeah, the but they were so successful. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so initially. I think Washington, especially in the South, uh, remains uh, really the dominant figure until his death. I, he dies in, in 1915. He dies in the uh, South, but from an from a national perspective, you would argue that well, I don't. More he, I mean, he's certainly he's st he's still uh, the one who's uh, recruiting all of the donors. He's the one involved with uh, the white philanthropists who are funding black education in the South. Uh, he's working with uh, the national Republican figures, uh, you know, Theodore Roosevelt and others. Uh, he controls all of the patronage. Uh, uh, Republican patronage to the extent that it exists. Uh, he's still extraordinarily active behind the scenes in uh, paying for court challenges to segregation statutes and things like that. He, you know, he, he doesn't have a, a sort of public stance of political protest, but behind the scenes he is, he is funding legal challenges. I think that was my point, was behind the scenes. And even uh, yeah, I mean, but 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 still, just in, I also think in sort of hearts and minds, uh, he's beloved in the in the South by, by by Southern blacks and so so in other words, Du Bois. I mean, 
they, they were called the intellectuals. <laughs> you know, they were a very small group. I was look, okay, I don't but, want to play that, but I'm looking at the, the extraordinary successes that the NAACP. Yeah, and of course over and of course over time over time, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know about those, those early years. But yeah, there is, there is, what, what comes to happen is there's a kind of battle going on, uh, you know, between Du Bois and Washington. Uh, that, that's, that's clear enough. There are criticisms beginning to be leveled at, at Washington. Yeah. Uh, I mean, part of what I tried to say is I, I think many of those Criticisms are, are really uh, somewhat unfair. Uh, I mean, especially, what, I mean, one thing that Du Bois will say, he accuses uh, Washington of just uh, putting forward a gospel of uh, work and money. Right? Sort of, you know, this is just, this is just ca capitalism. Uh, it's certainly true that Washington wants economic advancement, <laughs> uh, and he's not at all opposed to uh, to capitalism. But uh, Du Bois completely ignores this whole spiritual side of Washington, and it seems to me that the real essence of Washington is this spiritual message. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for the lecture. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, but the part that really caught my attention was um, toward the first part of his um, address on Lincoln, where he talks about 27 million Americans of another color. Yeah. And the national character that you spoke to, um, to know what constitutes our character as Americans, color should not be part of that distinction. And yet, when I get a census, one of the first questions in the annual in the, um, 10 year census is what is your ethnicity? Are you white? What is your color? So how do we move forward, do you think, in this development of a national character that is colorblind or blind to ethnicity? Yeah, um, and that's interesting to think about in the context of Booker T. Washington. I'm, certainly in the, in the time in which he lives, he is not really, uh, well, Frederick Douglass, for instance, clearly calls for colorblindness. He wants the nation to, you know, he's, he's, he's just total individualism. Uh, he wants the nation to, to not notice color. His prediction is if we ever get to that point, we will actually become a new nation. There'll be a composite American nationality. I mean, the, the, there won't be, you know, people will intermarry. If you don't see color, then you won't marry along racial lines anymore, and color will eventually sort of fade and disappear. That's his long-term prediction for America. Uh, Booker T. Washington, it, it seems to me, is uh, somewhat more sympathetic to race solidarity. Now, partly that's a suggestion that fits the times, right? There's this virulent segregation out there, and he has to maneuver within that. And so in the Atlanta Exposition Address, he offers that, that image, that metaphor. He says, we can be separate as the fingers in all things purely social, but one as the hand in everything necessary to mutual progress. Okay. So that's, that's interesting, right? There are some things that are purely social. What? Well, marriage, friendship maybe, right? It's unclear exactly what he has in mind. Uh, and of course, the vagueness is helpful because some people regard the boundaries of as pure, of purely social as very extensive and others don't. Uh, but he says we can be separate in those things that are purely social. But one is the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. And certainly, you know, what he has to do is build from within the black community. So he's the founder of the National Negro Business League. He's the founder of the Black State Teachers Association or, you know, all of these sort of uh, race specific organizations. Uh, and then, you know, uh, getting all of these black uh, schools established in the South. So he's working within that segregated order. Um, uh, he, he certainly wants l legal se segregation to be struck down. It's unjust, right? Uh, uh, he wants it to be struck down. 
but I'm not quite sure whether he thinks it's necessary to move towards total race blindness. Uh, and, and, and another sort of piece of evidence on this, uh, you know, because he knew these uh, white philanthropists in the North so well, often traveled North, uh, met with them, uh, he often received uh, invitations to dine at their homes. Um, he always declined those. Uh, and his reason, I think, was that he did not think it was helpful for blacks to measure themselves by the degree of their acceptance into white society. Uh, in other words, he had a very serious concern with self-esteem, and he wanted that self-esteem to be internal and based on one's own achievements and efforts. And it, uh, it should not be uh, gauged by this sort of external acceptance. And he thought if he accepted those invitations, it would be sending the wrong message. This is why to, support the uh, uh, well, You mean because it was, Blacks and whites, were, well, he, no, but he certainly wasn't opposed to blacks and whites working together. I mean, you know, uh, white donors visited Tuskegee and, you know, he built a lot of, he, he was building many bridges to, to, whites, to whites, not only in the north, but whites in Tuskegee, uh, in the town of Tuskegee itself. So he's not, a, he's not opposed to, to blacks working with whites and building those kinds of connections. But he, he, he did have this... He was, he was worried about the, the aim of the movement taking on uh, a kind of false direction. Uh, you can see the same concern actually in Malcolm X. There are some very interesting similarities between Booker T. Washington and Malcolm X. Uh, it's one of the reasons why Malcolm X rejects integration as the aim of the movement. Right. Malcolm X is also opposed to segregation, state-ordered segregation but he didn't think that you should posit integration as the aim of the movement. Yeah. Diana, Colleen? Diana, thank you so much for the um, uh, compelling and rich presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you about a question about America's challenge, both then and now. Um, if, if in the first half of the 20th century, um, the task at hand was the fulfillment of the birth of freedom. You know, Lincoln had proclaimed it, but now we have the actual work to do. Or more specifically, leaving discrimination behind. Mm -hmm. um, and in adopting spiritual liberty, we might get to the point of adopting civic equality. Um, so in essence, it sounds like the challenge was um, the age-old challenge of humanity. Um, or how the Gorgias puts it, you make that distinction between it's not so much how I'm hurt as whether I harm others. Mm -hmm. It has much more to do with the question of the soul. Um, and whether we put ourselves in a position of, of being capable of leading the challenge of governing ourselves. So that means that the question of the races isn't the most important question, it's a question of humanity. So um, my question is, I mean, today, um, I mean, it's almost like what Jefferson once said came true, that there are um, uh, deep-seated prejudices entertained by the whites and 10,000 recollections by the blacks of the injuries mm -hmm. sustained and make it impossible for us to ever um, really be one country. Um, and then, then that's sort of translated even further to the question of not just race, but the question of gender and various other identities. Mm -hmm. So that um, um, many people think the challenge today is not the question of spiritual liberty, it's simply mm -hmm. the question of equality. Um, so my question is, how much of America's challenge um, or even difficulties today are based on race or, any, or other forms of identity? And how much are actually um, matters of spiritual liberty? Yeah, I, I think... Uh Booker T's answer would be the same that he gave then. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always a, a spiritual question. Um, but that, I mean, that doesn't mean that we don't have a race problem. Uh, but but I, I think, well, I think Shelby Steele has argued this. 
that we are in a way dealing with the psychological legacy of these racial troubles and that confronting that psychological legacy is the most is the most difficult to do. And so all of these other things, diversity and identity politics, they're all ways of sort of avoiding the the really essential essential matters. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what, what Washington was trying to do was to find some way for Americans to break out of this spiral of sin and suffering, uh, this, this really perverse racial dynamic. Uh, he, he, he was trying to find a way out of that. Um, I don't know, that's, one, that's, that's not much of an answer. I don't know. Uh, so is there a way out? Well, I, I think the only way out would be to, again, listen to someone like Booker T. Washington. Uh, and, and I do think a, a figure like Shelby Steele was, was you know, is still doing, doing something like that, uh, trying to address those questions. Um, actually, you know, I, there are some things that give me more hope. Uh, the, the reparations debate. Uh, I think part of that reparations debate is, is rather destructive and it could take some bad, bad forms. But uh, in other ways, it's taking very good forms. I just read about um, um, a, a church in Bolton Hill in my city of Baltimore. Uh, Bolton Hill is um, somewhat more integrated now, but mostly a white neighborhood. And this is a mostly white church, uh, but it has a black uh, woman pastor. And I don't know quite how this came about, but she learned that her ancestors were owned by one of the prominent parishioners, the ancestors of a prominent parishioner. Uh, he belonged to one of these big, you know, uh, Baltimore uh, plantation families, uh, or he's, dis he's descended from them. So when they learned of this, her first reaction was, you know, I can't remain in this town, I'm gonna leave. <laughs> Uh, and then she said, no, let's, let's figure out how to, how to approach this. And uh, the, the congregation very deliberately undertook a kind of historical exploration and they did all the research they could about the family he belonged to and her family and they had meetings and I mean, it, it turned into something very, very wonderful and true reconciliation. But it had to be at the personal level, not at the sort of not at the political level. And then it turned into a, a, a kind of outreach to neighboring, you know, other neighborhoods, uh, majority black neighborhoods, uh, building links between their church uh, and some of the nearby black churches, and thinking about programs and you know, so that's, that's a very salutary form of reparations. And they understood it sort of in those terms, that that's what they were doing, kind of reconciliation and reparation. Uh, but that's very different from, I mean, I don't know how many people are actually suggesting cash payment, but you know, uh, Shelby still says this, cash payment to a you know, million dollars to every, uh, to every black uh, person in America wouldn't amount to a dime on the dollar of the, of the suffering entailed and wouldn't do anything to address the, the deeper psychological legacies of, of, of mastery and slavery. I mean, part of my fear, uh, there are some whites who, who want to embrace reparations because it would be a way of saying, yeah, all right, let's do that. And then we're done. That's it. <laughs> we paid, now we're done. We don't want to hear anything more. about the past or the troubles of the present. So, so I, I, is there a question in the back? Oh, there we're lined up here. Um, you can go first. Um, so I, I, my understanding that not much of a book or two options, so I'm just taking uh, everything you said uh, at face value. I uh, said this is supposed to serve as some sort of template to help us deal with contemporary issues. And so one of my worries is that this idea of spiritual freedom is a, actually a deeply unattractive idea, at least probably for most population. Um, I'm sorry, you'd say? This idea of spiritual freedom is a deeply, uh, deeply unattractive. And I'll unattractive. Try to ex uh, explain what I mean by this. So, yes. um, we have this notion that the good man can't be harmed, and we can go much further back than Augustine. We go to 
uh, Plato, and Socrates makes this claim explicitly, and then there's a whole debate in uh, ancient philosophy of to what extent he actually means this. Uh, but I'd like to say we at least have two models. So on Aristotle's model, you can flourish and have a good life, but virtue's not enough. This is why Priam has a miserable life, because there are external factors that matter immensely. Mm -hmm. So Priam can't be happy, uh, be virtuous as you will, the good life is inaccessible to you if certain external things happen to you. So Socrates um, may have believed this, it's a good amount of debate when we actually really believe this, but um, Aristotle certainly does. Uh, now, the Socratic idea we get explained in some of uh, Plato's dialogues gets radicalized by the Stoics, and the Stoics have the idea that ultimately they come to the a very attractive solution that you can be happy on the torture rack, right? All you need yeah. is virtue, you get, you, get, you get full spiritual liberty. Is that amazing? It's great. You can be happy without anything inside of yourself. How, how, how attractive. So what I'd like to suggest is that part of the issue is that if you really endorse the Stoic view, then you come to the absurd conclusion that the people who suffered most from slavery are the slavers, not the slaves. Because strictly speaking, the slaves had all the necessary framework to live fully happy lives as slaves. They need nothing outside their own virtue. Um, it's only on the Aristotelian model that you actually understand why slavery was so damn bad. Uh, namely, that they lacked all the things that, you know, Priam was deprived of at the end of his life. And you might just say, Priam, what's great is he had it from birth until very old age, near his death. And he loses everything, including his great son Hector and the not so great son uh, Paris. But uh, you see, on the Stoic view, it seems like, oh, well, you know, if only I knew how to be virtuous, if I only I could attain full spiritual liberty, well, these chains wouldn't matter. I'm yep. not he, sure that's yep. an easy that's, sell for anyone who's not, uh, doesn't yep. spend a lot of their life in the library. So I, I, I would like I to don't, suggest that, just let me finish, yep. the, the, the model of this, um, the idea that the slaves are being inconvenienced, yep. um, strikes me as just as implausible as the stoic idea of being happy on the rack. So it seems like, unless you have a view where you take really seriously the external goods that make make uh, eudaimonia uh, possible, then you can only fully account for why it's the slaves and not the slavers who suffered most. And I suspect if you, if you have this overly exalted view of internal freedom, and this might just be a question of degree, and I know that's perfectly uh, debatable, what's the right degree of anything, but it seems like if you're trying to put forward a model for, um, for, for the model that can be attractive, so the average person has to hear this as they get as part of their past, and it seems like you wouldn't want to overplay the stoic hand. Yeah. And so this slam, I'm very worried about. And the second point, just very quickly, was about the need to forget. You get no one And it seems like part of the problem is that uh, you might wonder if you ever can get to kind of putting it aside if you have to consistently talk about it. Uh, Ernest Renan, who wrote I, I didn't hear the first part. The, the, oh, the, the need, need to, to forget. He says there's a need to forget. To forget. No, he never says forget. To, well, yes, he talks about forget. He but, talks about the idea of putting something aside, like in a family. There's a feud you have to uh, put down. He, he certainly talks about forgiveness, but, um, uh, but forgiveness, but not. Ernest Renan. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were talking about oh, about Washington. Okay. Oh no, I never okay. talked about Washington. Okay. Uh, trust you entirely. Uh, and just about Ernest Renan's example is the Saint Barthélemy, the slaughter of the Protestants by the Catholics, the Huguenots. Yeah. Yeah. His point is, we can't get beyond that if every day we're talking about Catholic and Protestant relations. So, yeah, that's okay, yes. Um, no, I, I think that's uh, helpful. I mean, part of the reason that I'm putting so much stress on spiritual freedom is because I think this is extremely overlooked and ignored facet of Washington's thought. In other words, the way he's usually presented as he's just all about economics. Uh, he's all about these external factors, right? Uh, the gospel of, uh, of work and money the up by your bootstraps uh, teaching. So this is intended as a corrective. Uh, I think in fact that Washington has a pretty balanced position on this. Uh, so for him, spiritual freedom is primary and spiritual freedom is sort of the precondition in a way of the attainment of of full flourishing and, and full freedom. So, uh, I mean, he certainly doesn't uh, overlook these other elements, I mean, especially education and economics. And partly what he's calling for is a he's asking uh, for blacks through their spiritual freedom to, to rise. And he believes they are capable of rising and he says that through their rising, they will in a way redeem America. They have it within their power 
to be the source of America's redemption. Uh, and so it's interesting, he sort of, he, he says, uh, it's as if blacks are in the position of Christ, the Nazarene, except Christ had to suffer and be crucified. Uh, blacks have to rise and flourish. And by doing that, they will in a way fill the role of, of Christ. So he holds out this very uh, sort of redemptive vision. Um, So, but, I, but I, do, I do want to insist that for him, he means what he says about that spiritual freedom. So if asked the question, you must choose to be, to be lynched or to lynch, to be enslaved or to enslave, I think he means it quite seriously that if, if you believe in the soul and if you have a care for the soul, you would choose to be enslaved and to be lynched. That that harm is less. So he, he does mean that, the, that, the, uh, that whites have harmed themselves uh, through those centuries of oppression. And so I think he's very serious when he says, it is for the white man, I plead. Uh, My question might sort of build on this a little bit, maybe give you a, a pathway. Um, uh, though I will also plead ignorance to Booker T. Washington's work, and, and so I, I appreciate what you've uh, helped us here understand. Um, I, I can't help looking at this speech, I can't help but think of a reprint of Hegel, and so I'm sort of wondering if you can speak to any of the Hegelian influences on Booker T. Washington. Uh, uh, tell, tell me where the Hegel is. Now, now Du Bois, there's plenty of Hegel. He studied in Germany, yeah. got a degree there. Uh, because I see the way the speech is structured. First of all, I mean, it's sort of the Hegel's master slave, though, I think, in opposition. Oh, well, well yeah, sure, okay. Master yeah. Slave, though, I think. Uh, yeah. And they're, they're, they're yeah, but I think he came to that not through Hegel. You think, okay, I, I, I think, think he came to that because I was born a slave, as he said. That's conceivable. I mean, I don't know. I'm, so I'm, again, pleading ignorance. But I, it does seem to me, I mean, if, if you look at the speech, uh, the way it's structured is just as a kind of uh, you know, opposition between sort of universal in particular, you see that sort of like yeah. repeatedly in the structure here, and that's, you know, that's, at least to me, it just recalls the uh, Hegel structure in the novel of Spirit. And I don't know the extent to which that fits in with the discourse that you might have been having with voice. Um, I assume somewhat, but um, maybe you can speak to that, or maybe that would give you a uh, I can't really. You've blown me away with this question. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's a little uh, left field, I suppose. Now. Um, I'm fairly certain that he would never have read Hegel. Um, but uh, if, there, if there are truths in Hegel, uh, I believe that Booker T could have discovered them through another route. I mean, this is, this is uh, what, what's surprising about reading Lincoln, too. Uh, I mean, he wouldn't have any you know, familiarity. He had very, you know, in a certain way, very limited education. Uh, and yet he seems to, it seems to prove that there are philosophic temperaments uh, and people who discover things through life experience. Uh, I mean, one of the things that Du Bois is always criticizing Booker T. Washington for is that he thinks that, that uh, Washington downplays book learning and only talks about the value of experience and work. Yeah. So I think the last two questions both have to do with kind of so wonder the kind of opaque theoretical <laughs> theological background because this you start off by saying Lincoln was an instrument of providence and then he has a service of being an example that's then imitated through others and it's striking that there's a very very sophisticated theological uh, backdrop to this political thought um, well I guess I would say it's just he, Christian <laughs> well, he, is it, he's, he's raised in the chair he's raised in the it, uh, he, he does seem to me the he does seem to me the most Christian of all of the African American uh, leaders. Uh, more Christian in a certain sense than Martin Luther King. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I I, I I I don't know that there's a sophisticated framework. Bill, maybe you want to address this. 
<laughs> but I will make some observations uh, if we then get the question and we listen to the conversation. Uh, I'm reminded, as you reminded us, of his relative to early death. Yeah, 59. So that the, the tension between Washington and the NAACP don't amount to a great deal since the media was sustained before the greatest impact of the NAACP was felt including uh, the voice of the accommodation of Woodrow Wilson mm -hmm. to speak of the paradoxes mm -hmm. in these comparisons. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there are a number of levels of analysis that seem to me to highlight what Washington is doing as radically unlike what succeeded him in almost every instance. And to indicate that, I would say I would not use the word solidarity, but mm -hmm. the word sufficiency. Mm -hmm. that, that what I find in Washington is an emphasis on black self-sufficiency, yeah. which is both a moral and a practical posture. Uh, practically, he illustrated that quite well in his focus on education and economics. Morally, the question is, how does one stand in relationship to one's democracy and be able to stand on one's own feet if mm -hmm. not in a position of dependence requires a highly developed sense of self-sufficiency. It seems to me that that is what Washington is arguing for. He's not a Gabi act. He's not a mm -hmm. separatist. Yeah, and yeah, I would want to. not urging near of solidarity, but his position would be akin to that that one might make if one makes the argument that voluntary segregation is perfectly harmless. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no aspiration of free traffic upon it, if that's what people chose. But not that he's recommending that, but recommending that people are free to make their own choices and to make their way in the world while making their own choices without being penalized unjustly based on race, ethnicity, or otherwise. So, so if that is true, it seems to me that he has a response to the norm, and a response to the harm principle and all the rest of it that's very obvious, namely that one doesn't have to take the measure of a full life in order to determine its work. One only has to take the measure of the posture which the life is conducted. There may be accidents that we fall, and therefore Creole may lose everything in the end, but even Aristotle actually argues that's quite irrelevant because one understands Aristotle's argument. So, so it's not the fact that when they die, having suffered a great tragedy that makes them unhappy in our country, that's quite the obvious. One only has to deserve happiness in our country. And that seems to be the argument you're making about Washington. So if I put these things together, one should live so as to deserve happiness, and that requires self-sufficiency, then it seems to me Washington's argument is an argument that says, as a title of the book, I've gotten past slavery up from slavery. Mm -hmm. And I was taken when you made that observation earlier in the lecture because I've been spending about two weeks in relationship to the 1619 project, explaining to me that there's something very peculiar about the requirement that the descendants of mm -hmm. black slaves must always wear their ancestors, the badges of their ancestors' chains. And every human being on earth is descendants of black slaves, serves, you know, peasants or whatever, without mm -hmm. wearing such badges. That describes the peculiarity of the situation in the United States. And Booker T. Washington, by saying, up from slavery, I would ask, is he not really indicating that the path up, the human path, is accessible to the slaves as accessible to everyone else, and therefore should defend with nothing other than people leaving the space free, which includes spiritual liberty, for the slaves to rise up from slavery? I've got a very commonsensical and commonplace observation. But yeah, and and it's why you know all of his effort is on education, right? The way up from slavery is through education, and maybe just as a kind of testament that Washington was in a way correct. Uh, I mean, his argument was that once blacks had prepared themselves 
through educational advancement and economic advancement that political transformation would come. And, and uh, so, so it, it, it wasn't that he was giving up on politics. Po I think political equality, full political and civic equality was, was the end point that he was aiming at. But he believed that it would be a kind of natural consequence. While it still might require a struggle, it would be a kind of natural consequence of uh, educational and economic advancement. Uh, and there's a kind of factoid that, that uh, maybe uh, shows this at work. Uh, in 1865, uh, illiteracy among the black population was nearly universal. By 1900, 55% of black Americans were literate. By 1900, 55%. By 1940, 90% were literate. Uh, I would say it's no accident that the real movement on civil rights comes after that and, and pretty soon after that, right? in the 50s and the 60s. Um, so, to me, it's an indication that uh, if there had been even more full-throated you know, uh, uh, pursuit of what Washington was calling for, that that moment of political liberation might have come even sooner. Um, so he, so uh, this relates to his gradualism also. right? He, he, he basically says there is no other way than gradual. Uh, and and in, a, in a certain sense, Frederick Douglass understood this too. I mean, Douglass fought very hard for the 15th Amendment. He wanted to get that 15th Amendment in the Constitution. Uh, but Douglass, I think Douglass knew it, was, uh, it would be retracted. It would not be enforced. Um, but for Douglass, it was important to have those words in the Constitution as a standard, as something to appeal to, as a weapon. Uh, but uh, this was one thing that Douglas and, and Washington disagreed on. Washington thought that, th that we had moved too quickly towards political franchisement, and that had something to do with prompting backlash against it, uh, and that it would necessarily take just a certain amount of time. Uh, but in, a, in, 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 in one sense, I think Washington and, and Douglas both saw that the same. They knew how long it would take. What were the differences, if I might, between that fascinating statistic yeah. between the literacy rates in the North and the South? Ah, uh, that uh, I don't, I don't know, but um, a lot of work come from the integration of the armed services and from the well, no, this is, I mean, 1900 is, is, is 55 percent literate. I mean, this, I, I, no, no, no. This comes from those 5,000 schools. Uh, uh, yeah. built by yeah, that would suggest that literacy would be higher in the South than the North, and that's that uh, would well in the in the North. I mean, it varied. I mean, not all schooling was segregated in the North. It depended on mm -hmm. where and yeah. Yeah. So that would argue yeah. that most of those coming North were literate. Well, I would believe this. No, I know. That's why I find it such a fact. But I mean, that's a nationwide statistic. So by 1940, 90% literate. And, and it might be lower now. I mean, that's a horrible thing to say, but it might be, I mean, functional illiteracy, you know, the kind of literacy needed to succeed in a modern society. Well, that's a very bad note to end on. But I, I, guess it, I guess it tells us what our task is. I mean, it does seem to me that, that that's where the effort should be, education still. Just yes. really quick, I was curious if you had the statistics for white literacy in those same time periods. Um, no, but uh, white literacy, especially like eight, 1860s, would have been much, much higher. 90% seems really high for 1940. For 1940? Yeah. I'm not, oh. I'm not arguing the fact, I'm just saying that that, that feels high for, but that's good. Yeah, so I mean, that, I mean, this is one thing that Washington was, you know, here, here's the advancement, here's where we are. He was constantly sort of 
keeping those. They, but these statistics come from the, from the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. well, I do have one more question that's a real question. Yeah. <laughs> you, you spoke about uh, Douglas's rhetorical move to appropriate, the, to, to, to revise the appropriation of Lincoln. Oh, what, Washington's or, or Douglas's? Oh, pardon me, Washington's. Yeah. I mean, they both, they both, they both to the, doing that, yeah. But, but, but you were saying that he was also being appropriated as a supremacy. Yeah. Uh, but of course, this is very close to the time when the uh, unreconstructed spokesperson for the South were reviving Lincoln as a tyrant. Mm. And, and, and shortly moving into that phase, if not already by then, of hating Lincoln rather than trying to use him covertly. Yeah. So, I'm just wondering what is the connection in that point in time between yeah. Douglas, what Washington is witnessing and what eventually took place. Yeah, that's good. I, you know, I don't, I don't actually know. That's a good question. But, but this again sort of shows that uh, for Washington, the reviling of Lincoln might be more dangerous. Precisely. And so it's actually that's why he's willing to sort of take the supremacist embrace of Lincoln and try to turn it to twist it to give it a different a different a different valence yeah yeah great thank you all okay, thank you.